Good evening. Welcome to our special on the Shaw Prize 2019. I'm Diana Lin. The Astronomy Award goes to Dr. Edward Stone for his leadership in the past four decades of the Voyager mission that has transformed our understanding of the four giant planets and the outer solar system. It has now begun exploring interstellar space. Dr. Stone works here at Caltech. I arrived at Caltech in 1964 to join in setting up a new space physics course. An idea was brewing to explore the giant planets in the outer solar system. It's a big challenge because the sun is much dimmer, there's less solar power. You need help from flying by a planet to give you an extra boost, a slingshot effect. In 1965, a graduate student at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, that's run by Caltech, made a timely discovery. If you launched a spacecraft in 1977, it could fly by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all lined up on the same side of the sun, waiting to be surveyed. That happens once every 176 years. In 1972, designs for Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft were approved. The first automated spacecraft that could take care of itself, it had a problem, it would switch to some backups, all auto autonomously on board. Professor Stone moved to JPL as the project scientist of the Billion Dollar Mission, presiding over 11 teams, totaling some 200 scientists. Engaged in designing, building instruments, and then analyzing the data as it was coming in during our encounters. One advantage uh, was that I had uh, developed instruments which had flown in space. Edward Stone enrolled at the University of Chicago in 1956. And in 1957, Sputnik was launched. Suddenly there was a whole new space physics field, just waiting for instruments that could actually measure what's out there. For his thesis experiment in 1961, he designed, assembled, and tested a telescope that was launched into polar orbit and measured cosmic rays and solar particles. It was fellow Chicago U alumnus Robbie Vogt who got Ed Stone to join him at Caltech and to head the Voyager mission. Vogt said he himself was originally offered the job but declined. Stephen, I disagreed with somebody, I let them know, I think you are not very competent. Ed, on the other hand, had the patience to bring out the best in people. I became involved when the National Academy of Sciences got upset and said basically, JBL has engineered the most beautiful, most perfect spacecraft, but it has no science instruments. JBL needed Ed Stone. From the moment he took office, he was instrumental in making sure that this spacecraft could do science. It makes it so much more valuable to be a member of the team, um, to have him explain to you why this science is unique and what's important about it. That's a parabolic antenna which focuses all the energy in a beam and it always points to Earth to send the data. So that sets the scale about three and a half meters across. The bay beneath, with its golden record cover, has all the electronics for the spacecraft. The science boom has three instruments. The top one for things moving nearly the speed of light. The one down here is the low energy charged particles. I was responsible for the designing was the one for the low energy particles. Particle would come in the top. These detectors did really wonderful work at each of the planets where uh, trapped radiation was measurable by these uh, four telescopes, which looked in four different directions. The third thing measures the solar wind from the sun. Out on the end was uh, the scan platform, which could point those instruments, which included two cameras, uh, at various objects as we fly by the planets and their moons. Three, two, one. Voyager was launched in 1977. Our first flyby was Jupiter in 1979, and we were surprised every day. We learned that the Great Red Spot is just the largest of many storms in Jupiter's atmosphere. 
last for more than 100 years. We got up close and started taking pictures, and it was just turbulence. And that was very surprising. All this being analyzed in real time, because Ed infused his team with that enthusiasm, with that rigor, with that devotion. He really was able to lead in a very respectful and a very gracious manner. The moons were quite re remarkable. The surface of Io, with all of the black lava lakes, we had volcanic activity 10 times that of the entire Earth. The moon Europa is covered with white ice. There's a liquid water ocean under that icy cap that's on that planet. Perhaps there's life there. Next flyby was Saturn. Sunlight's only 1% of that here on Earth. Moons orbiting created wakes in uh, the rings, which are in fact just a icy snowballs. Moon Titan has a nitrogen atmosphere of rivers and lakes of liquid natural gas, which may resemble the early Earth before life evolved and, and created all the oxygen that we breathe today. On to Uranus, 19 times as far from the sun as the Earth. One of the small moons called Miranda is an icy body, but look at the number of earthquake faults. And there's a cliff kilometers high on this small moon that's only 500 kilometers in diameter. On then to Neptune, which is now 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth. So little energy from the sun. But it turns out the fastest winds we've seen in the solar system were on the very cold Neptune. Moon Triton, that's only four degrees above absolute zero. The really surprising thing was we saw geysers are erupting from that very cold uh, region. Every time we went by a new planet, it was different. And we never got tired, and we, the surprises never stopped. Ed is the visionary who is able to keep this together. Ed had to know a lot about everybody's science so that he could make a good decision and, and try to bring him to a consensus. He could see the strengths and weaknesses. Dr. Stone was a great leader for Voyager. The hardest time we had, I think, was first, just after launch, a command didn't get sent at the right time, and one of our receivers, which is the way we can talk to the spacecraft, stopped working. But we had a backup receiver, uh, and that's the way we flew the rest of the mission. Another critical time was when Voyager uh, 1 flew by Saturn. Its scan platform, which could point the camera at different things to look at, stopped. Fortunately, once again, we found a way to repair that remotely. Dr. Stone was also the public face of the Voyager missions. We had six flybys, two of Jupiter, two of Saturn, then one of Uranus and Neptune each. During each encounter, we would have a routine uh, press conference uh, in the mornings. I would be responsible for deciding the science part. And the reporter put his hand up and said, Dr. Stone, why do you always have more questions than answers? And uh, Dr. Stone said, that's good. That's the way it should be. Because if you knew what the answers were before you got there, there would be no point in going there. Ed is very, very good at getting up and giving a talk and explaining complicated things in a simple fashion. Created a lot of enthusiasm in the public for Voyager, for planetary science. And it had a profound impact the for the people who funded space research, right? <laughs> including Congress. We had what I call the terracentric view, a view based on what we knew about the Earth. Voyager really changed our view of the solar system. How the solar system formed and how the planets got there, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and all the things that uh, life is made out of. Voyager 1, looking back at the solar system beyond Neptune, this image has in it the pale blue dot, a very tiny speck of light, which is the Earth. Coming up, Voyager in interstellar space. Over a one and a half million kilometers per hour of uh, wind blowing outward from the sun, creating a huge bubble. All the planets are inside the bubble. In 2012, 
Voyager 1 became the first human-made object to enter interstellar space to leave the solar bubble behind. Always believing there's a chance that it could arrive in interstellar space. That vision caused a lot of people to start enlarging their own vision of what could be done in these sort of science missions. It turns out that the heliosphere is a radiation shield that's protecting the Earth. There's four times more radiation outside the bubble than inside. One of our big discoveries was getting to the interstellar medium and measuring galactic cosmic rays. Galactic cosmic rays are high energy nuclei and they're passing through your body. Their origin is exploding stars, but nobody knew the energy distribution. It had a lot to do with keeping Voyager going till we got there because there was a number of attempts to save money and turn it off. Between uh, Saturn and Uranus on Voyager 2, I became the, the chair of the Division of Physics, Math, and Astronomy at Caltech, and my office was right here on East Bridge. And in 1991, Ed Stone was made director of JPL for a decade. We still run our lab in the evenings. We would be at the board in mid-sentence, and the secretary or somebody would come in and say, you got to go to Washington right now. So he would take off. He would come back three days later, and we would just start exactly where we left off. He was an incredible multitasker. He's very happy, and he's not uh, bogged down by the pressures that you'd expect of people with his level of achievement. We had to find ways to do, do more with less money. So it was really an exciting time. 20 different projects over that time period I really helped formulate and then learned from. We were surprised what was out there. We wanted to go back and stay for a long period of time. The Galileo spacecraft orbited Jupiter for eight years. Cassini orbited Saturn for 13 years. Dr. Stone remains the project scientist for the Voyager mission. He's an active research scientist and he's running an international consortium. He's available for his students and he presents to the public. This combination of skills is rare, but one that will advance science immeasurably. Voyager 1 is now something like 22 billion kilometers from the sun. Voyager 2 is at about 18 billion kilometers. The power for the spacecraft is these three radioisotope thermoelectric generators. It's plutonium-238, Natural radioactive decay creates heat, and heat is converted into electricity. We will be out of power between five and 10 years from now for all the science instruments. What will the voyagers do then? Every 225 million years, they will make an orbit all around the Milky Way, and they will be doing that for billions of years. A great strength of it is the mental discipline to be able to control how much time he spends on each and succeeds. I'm really interested in helping people realize their dreams. I've had a wonderful journey myself in terms of discovery. It's pretty amazing to encounter a lot of people who respect him and, and love him. Sure. <laughs> he has a very cute smile, a real funny sense of humor, and a very uh, gentle, kind person. A gentleman in every respect, he is the smartest person I've ever been around. He's a really cool guy. Ed is indefatigable, and he runs across campus, people chasing after him. Very fast, from one meeting to the next, zoom, 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 the Energizer bunny. Nobody knows what he looks like because when he's coming towards you, he's blue shifted, and when he's going away, he's red shifted. <laughs> and stone is the fastest particle in the universe. <laughs> Ed grew up in Burlington, Iowa, where his father was a construction superintendent. He built uh, schools, hospitals, churches. I just kind of got to learn from him about how interesting it was to know how things work and how to fix things. I built radios, I built high fidelity systems. Uh, so I was a hands-on uh, building what were in those days was advanced technology. Ed's mother worked in the family franchise business. 
later on in life, she was painting China, which uh, she uh, contributed to her church. I found it fascinating that you could actually calculate things, you could actually design things. I just sort of grew up thinking I would like to be a scientist. His physics teacher recommended the University of Chicago. He says so it's a very high-rated physics department and would work very well for me. It did. Ed met Alice from rural Illinois at Chicago U. I got a scholarship, probably majoring in English. We met on a blind date through mutual friends, and it clicked. Did you like her the minute you saw her? Oh, yeah, I, yes. <laughs> we, we had similar backgrounds and similar kinds of families, uh, so it was a good, uh, very easy uh, match. She was really uh, smart uh, and interested in what I was doing. He was smart, funny, just as skinny then as he is now. My parents were a little uneasy when they sent me to Chicago, but when they found out that Edward's grandfather was a Methodist minister, they decided maybe he was a good person for me to know. The couple married in 1962. He did not get down on one knee and propose. It was just that we were talking about our life in the future, and it was just a decision for the two of us to get married. The family moved to California when he joined Caltech. While raising two daughters, Alice obtained a bachelor's degree in business administration and worked as a freelance writer. During Voyager encounters, he would bring his work home in the form of photographs that had been taken just that day and show them to us over the dinner table before they were released to the press the next day. They were overwhelming. This was a, really a, a journey of discovery. My family were part of that whole journey. That was very exciting. The kids loved it. We would go to JPL when they had what they're called encounters, watch the pictures come in. It was awesome. I have great memories of that. Growing up with my dad, uh, was always an experience in learning. As a dad, uh, he is gentle. He is very well-intentioned in, in his earnestness in finding out about us. And then when our grandsons came along, they also had a chance to share it. I was raised on space. We had space placemats and Pluto was still on there. You start seeing old footage, I see videos of my grandpa, like on TV. And you know, that's, a, he's giving announcements and I'm like, that's my grandpa. I think his work is fantastic. Yeah. I think we both work his work is fantastic. This is probably the, the second most important uh, science project that's ever been accomplished by humans. Um, second only to going to the moon. I was proud of him. I was proud of the whole Voyager team. All those dozens and dozens of people worked very, very hard. Sometimes they slept at the lab overnight. It is immersive. They lose themselves in it. And so that's what drives them. His work ethic is like to me, like the ideal, and that's something like I strive for even to this day. When I first met him, I quickly learned that it's a pretty big deal and he's done a lot of impressive things. Probably the smartest person I've ever met, but he manages to not be arrogant about it. He's a very humble person. He, he enjoys the simple things in life. He enjoys a beer in the afternoon. Um, he enjoys his family, I hope. <laughs> We go on vacations with Ed and Alice every year. They are perfect in-laws. They're there when we need some help, and they kind of let us handle our lives the rest of the time. Very self-disciplined, um, but also very full of genuine joy in what it is that he has uh, done um, with his career and his life. There is not much leisure time as far as Ed is concerned. There are no hobbies. My real hobby is what I do. It's, it's real work, but for me, it's a hobby. Lately, he's been at home, which has been very nice. We would both sort of like to take a cruise on the Mississippi River up through the area where we lived. But Ed has no plan to retire. 
He had worked for 24 years on two 10-meter telescopes at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. They're currently the most productive telescopes on Earth because they can see the furthest out into space. We're now starting to design is a 30-meter telescope. It's 81 times brighter than what Keck can do. So this will allow us to see the first stars in the universe as they were forming, as well as looking at planets around nearby stars. But the project is disrupted by protests from native Hawaiians. When I look up at the sky, I think of where are the frontiers? Where do we go next to help us understand everything about the nature around us here on Earth and in the solar system? And in the other planetary system, the frontiers out there are immense. There is a science frontier, there's a technical frontier. We are never going to visit it all.